Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about chapter three of Invisible Man. And just when you think, just when you thought uh, things wouldn't get any crazier than they could get in chapters one or chapter two, chapter three, in chapter three, Allison finds a way to uh, make things even crazier, even more exciting, when literal chaos, pandemonium breaks out in the golden day. So at the end of chapter two, we were wondering what, what, what ominous uh, uh, events would occur at the golden day, and Allison does not disappoint. Uh, similarly, you can look at the, you can just jump ahead to the end of chapter three, and uh, they're leaving the old golden day and have to return to face, uh, the narrator has to return to face the college president after having taken Norton on uh, such a misadventurous journey. So even at the end of chapter four, uh, Ellison recognizes that the pace of this novel, um, the structure, the anxious anticipation that he builds in from episode to episode uh, continues. And so we're get, we, have that, we have that to look forward to. But in the meantime, we need to look at uh, chapter three. At the end of chapter two, we were, uh, if you'll recall, we were wondering uh, about Norton's reaction to having heard the story of Mr. Trueblood and his inadvertent impregnation of his daughter. And one of the things that we didn't talk about that is probably worth considering is, uh, while it's understandable, while the black community uh, in the area would be ashamed and embarrassed of Mr. Trueblood and want to eject him from the community, it's less clear while, why the white community rallies around him and lavishes his family with uh, new clothes and money and other gifts. Um, and, and so it's probably worth thinking about why would a white com why would the white community uh, seemingly uh, support and maybe even uh, in, in a weird sort of way tacitly approve of Trueblood's, Trueblood's horrible behavior? And the only thing I think that uh, you can think about is that in both instances, the reaction of the uh, white community and the reaction of the black community uh, deals with this notion of stereotypes. What the black community is reacting to is true blood uh, for them is the embodiment of all those unfair stereotypes that whites uh, have of blacks, those of being uh, you know, irresponsible and uh, uh, lascivious, uh, interested in uh, or unable to control their uh, the various uh, desires or bodily impulses, and for the whites, the uh, for the white community, it perhaps is the same. It's the same notion that uh, here is an example of uh, an African American who is living down to those stereotypes. In contrast to perhaps what they might see as you know the uppity African Americans in the college community, and so they uh, find their beliefs, their, uh, their prejudiced beliefs in, the black, in, in, uh, in black people confirmed. And uh, when they have their beliefs confirmed, they feel good about that. And so it enables them to be condescending and give all of these gifts when what they're really doing is uh, you know, reinforcing publicly this notion that here is an example of uh, you know, what black people really are like. And so, in a way, uh, Norton, who himself gives $100 to True Blood, uh, for all of his noble-seeming impulses in supporting the black college, recognizes deep down, or believes deep down, that uh, you know, these people are you know, barely above the uh, level of uh, brutes, beasts, or animals. And this is, uh, you know, and, and this idea is interesting because uh, it resonates because when he goes to the Golden Day, he sees, you know, once again, uh, the, uh, you know, these uh, black veterans descending into chaos and violence. And so I want to talk about uh, Chapter 3 today. And I want to talk about it in, in uh, four different respects. I want to talk about the structure of it, the characters, uh, the style that Allison uses, and then the themes that, that he reinforces, that he propagates in this chapter. Uh, when uh, the, uh, if you look at the, let's look at the structure of it, as we approach the Golden Day, uh, if you'll recall, Mr. Norton is in need of some sort of what he calls a stimulant, so he needs some sort of whiskey, and uh, obviously the narrator doesn't want to take him to any place where he's apt to be seen or recognized, so he takes him to the Golden Day, which is a, a tavern slash brothel that, uh, you know, that, that members of the black community in the area frequent. And so, uh, as, as he approaches that, and again, the readers don't know the Golden Day, uh, there's this really uh, prolonged, slow reveal. Uh, as as um, the narrator drives Mr. Norton in his car, he talks about seeing some people in the distance. He says, you know, he sees them, and uh, he doesn't explain who they, who they are. He doesn't describe them 
uh, until much later in the paragraph and in, in succeeding paragraphs. And so the audience is left wondering, well, what is this uh, encroaching fear? What is this, this growing dread that uh, the narrator has? And so you can see even in the way uh, within a chapter, the way Ellison writes is kind of like slowly developing anxiety, uh, then fulfilling our, our greatest fears, uh, and then leaving us with, uh, you know, in additional or with a, a, with a new uh, quantum of dread or anxiety for the next episode. So we're never at peace in this book, and, and that's probably uh, deliberate because the narrator himself is torn and, uh, as well. I mean, he's never at peace, and so uh, once again we see an author trying to enable the reader to feel, to empathize with the, with the main character. Uh, in addition, uh, you know, to the uh, you know to the slow reel, we do get uh, you know quite a lot of you know, really uh, frenetic action, an action that is actually quite terrifying. For example, at one point, uh, Mr. Norton, who is in a quite debilitated condition, uh, gets physically struck. He gets slapped by the pockmarked faced man. He gets pushed down the stairs by an angry, disappointed uh, prostitute, and and the doctor himself, who is treating him, uh, talks about how Mr. Norton better get out of there because it won't be too long before the, uh, the, the blacks who are all drunk and out of control and in a violent frenzy realize that they have under their control a uh, member of not just the white community but the uh, white, uh, white elite which they can tear limb from limb. So there's, real, there's a real fear, a real anxiety that Norton himself could be completely destroyed and so uh, you know, we see Ellison toying with that idea. It's relatively early in the book uh, but the uh, but the idea of a you know revolution of a, a black uprising you know is clearly uh, planted early on, uh, so we have that threat to to, Nor to Norton, uh, and and then you know as as we've already said you know we have that anxiety that continues from the beginning of the chapter through to the very end of the chapter, and, and it's probably worth talking about uh, you know some of the the characters and, and particularly uh, our narrator, the narrator himself is is really divided in this chapter, and you can see it quite clearly. On the one hand, he has this obligation to protect Norton and to get him out of there safely. On the other hand, you also recognize that he has these uh, rebellious, subversive impulses that you know he's talked about before. Uh, on one hand, he has this desire when they see them all, when he sees the uh, other uh, blacks, the veterans of World War I, attacking their attendant supercargo, he has this desire to, uh, you know, to join in, uh, which he has to repress because uh, that would be inappropriate for his role. But that desire is uh, he recognizes and it's undeniable. Similarly, when he hears the uh, doctor speaking disrespectfully to Mr. Norton later, on the one hand he's horrified, but on the other he's thrilled by it that that someone actually can speak to white authority in such a direct, uh, in such a direct way on such an even footing, and and so on the one hand. He is, uh, he's thrilled by this idea of revolution, of overturning the power structure. On the other, he also has this, uh, you know, this, this self-disciplined, uh, repressive willpower to work within the white system. And he's even called out by that, uh, on that by the doctor, who says that he's basically a machine, that all he wants to do is please his white masters and uh, advance himself that way. And so the, the main character has that kind of division within him. And I think that's, uh, you know, that is something that he recognized uh, for us in the prologue, and now something that we're seeing him work through in, uh, as he makes his way from young adulthood to maturity. Uh, it's, it's probably uh, worthwhile to think about the way that while all of this activity is going on, Ellison is also very careful to overlay the uh, all this activity with some you know fairly elegant writing stylistics. Uh, he makes it really easy for us uh, in many of these chapters by having his imagery be so white and black. For example, you might recall that uh, when the bartender, the owner of the establishment, is preparing drinks, when he pours beers, as as you know you, you might have seen in uh, television commercials, when the beer is poured, there's this white foamy head uh, on the top of the beer. And so the Ellison makes this, this comment of how the bartender is uh, cutting off the white heads of the beer. And that decapitation of white heads, uh, while literally describes the beer, obviously suggests you know, a much more uh, significant uh, 
decapitation, a much more significant uh, removal of uh, the locus of white power. Uh, similarly, supercargo is noted to wear a white uniform, and when he appears, out, you know, at, when he hears all the commotion downstairs, and he comes out of the room in which he's been with a prostitute, he's only wearing his white underwear, his white shorts. Uh, so you have this enormous black man in white shorts, and you see the, the kind of divide. On the one hand, uh, he is, you know, he is black. On the other hand, he represents white authority, and, and hence his uniform is white. And it is that, uh, that authority, uh, both uh, literally and figuratively, that the denizens of the uh, Golden Day attack. And so they beat him uh, mercilessly and senselessly because this is their opportunity to rebel when they've not had that opportunity before. And there's, uh, in, addition to, uh, in addition to those bits of white-black symbolism, one of, the, uh, one of the veterans also talks about uh, the, a roulette wheel as an image and how there's white and black on a roulette, roulette wheel. And that uh, he says you should bet on black because while originally uh, black was in ascendance, uh, whites have in the modern era taken over but the guy says that if you you know stick with it long enough, long enough, uh, black will again reign. And so uh, there too is uh, you know some suggestion of an upsetting of what has become the uh, the established power structure. It's also worth thinking about the uh, the various you know themes of the book. And one of the one of the big ones that we get talked about in chapter three is this idea of disrespect. All of these veterans who are, who are going to the Golden Day, who look like you know shiftless, alcoholic maniacs, actually are uh, you know all veterans of World War One. And prior to going to World War One, or at some point, uh, they were all professionals. They're you know doctors, lawyers, teachers, preachers, uh, and so the idea that they've been reduced to these uh, you know basically criminals. At one point, the narrator says. They look like they're members of a chain gang, or in other words, uh, you know, criminals who are chained together and taken out to clean highways or uh, or perform other maintenance um, in, in a compulsory fashion. But in fact, that's not the case. And you see that even from the very beginning of the chapter, when you have a uh, what is obviously a hyper-educated uh, doctor talking about the effects of a boxing match and how uh, you know the the uh, the, the, the fighting affects someone physiologically. And so here, and, and, and the, this idea of disrespect is perhaps to its highest point when the doctor is talking to Mr. Norton and talking about how while he was uh, perfectly able to be a, a doctor, even a brain surgeon in France during World War I and save lives, when it, once he was back in America, he was, you know, all of his medical training, all of uh, who he really was, was disregarded because he was black, and so therefore, uh, of someone who is, who should be repressed, disrespected, and obviously the doctor has you know uh, a lot of simmering fury over that, and talks about that or rages at, at Norton about that, and ultimately threatens uh, Norton with his personal safety, uh, and says that he's having a very tough time restraining himself, and so Norton better get out while he has the opportunity, and so one of the um, one of the themes uh, of this book that uh, we see brought up over and over is this notion of disrespect, of reducing someone to uh, the level of an animal based on their skin. Another, another theme that uh, we see Ellison developing is this notion of seeming versus being. Uh, the idea that what someone looks like on the outside isn't really necessarily who they are on the inside. You know, we see that obviously with the uh, with the black people at the Golden Day because while they look like they're you know a bunch of crazy animals, in fact they are disrespected professionals who have been shell shocked or otherwise, or in other words, traumatized for World War One and obviously receiving inadequate treatment, and so they're reduced to the level of and, and made into drunken automatons. Uh, conversely, Norton himself. Well, at the on the outside, he looks like the uh, you know the a paragon of decorum. Actually, upon closer examination, uh, he himself is the true animal. His teeth have this kind of like pointed, beastly-like appearance. Uh, the uh, prostitutes recognize or, or opine that he actually has animal you know animal parts. In fact, not just any animal parts, but uh, animal uh, sexual parts, which are which which form the true nature of his character. 
So while Norton appears to be uh, respectable uh, upon closer examination, he's actually uh, he's actually you know the greedy, avaricious beast, the animal that uh, all the uh, black people are generally accused of being. And then finally, the other the other theme that is brought up is this notion of apocalypse. Uh, at one point early in the chapter, the uh, narrator is grabbed by one of the one of the veterans and said that the apocalypse is coming at 5:30 or something like that. And this notion that the end is near, that there's going to be some cataclysmic change in the uh, in this in societal structure, this is an idea that you know we we see the narrator talk about from the prologue on. And so now that we're at the end of the chapter, and he has to go back to the uh, back to the black college, and face the music, and face his uh, face the president of the college, uh, who will try to reimpose the power structure. We're we're left to wonder, well, what is going to happen next? And so we're going to look at that in chapter four for next time. Chapter four again is one of those longer chapters. So we'll look at the first half of it. Uh, in, in the next video, and then the second half, half of that in the video that follows. All right, well, we'll see you next time.